While the phrase never appears in the Constitution, it's interpreted from two separate clauses in the First Amendment. Separation of church and state. It actually comes from a letter written by Thomas Jefferson where he describes a metaphorical wall between the two. So let's talk about what it is, what it became, and what some people still want it to become. So let's talk about what it was originally, and let me start with one simple fact. The United States of America is not a Christian nation. We never were, and according to the Constitution, never should be. The word God, capital G, Jesus, Christ, Christianity, or anything like that never appear in the Constitution. The rights given to you are, in fact, from the Constitution. That's just how it is. When people say that their rights are given to them by God, what they're usually referring to is this line from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with inherent and inalienable rights, that among these include life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. First off, let me be absolutely clear. The Declaration of Independence is not law. It's not part of the Constitution, and it cannot be used as an argument in the Supreme Court. Second, it says that people are endowed by their Creator, capital C, whoever that may be, to the individual. It is not clearly meant to refer to the Christian God. And lastly, there are three rights given to you by your Creator. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's no free speech here, there's no protection from cruel and unusual punishment. Those are given to you by the Constitution. The Constitution was written intentionally to be secular. Of course, some founding fathers were avid Christians, and some were very staunch atheists. So you can pick and choose from the Federalist Papers, which likewise cannot be used as evidence or as an argument in the Supreme Court. To say that this guy says it was intended to be this, and this guy says it was intended to be that. The end result is the Constitution being the way it is. So what's in the Constitution? There's only one reference to religion in the Constitution proper. Article 6, Section 3 states that no religious test shall ever be required as qualification to any office or public trust in the United States, meaning that you cannot be excluded from office because of your religious views. Many voters might take your religion into consideration while voting, but when it comes to the government and their qualifications, your religion does not matter. That was it until the Bill of Rights. If you watch my videos on the Bill of Rights, you'll remember that the First Amendment has five freedoms. Speech, press, religion, petition, and assembly. The freedom of religion has two parts. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The first part, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion, is referred to as the Establishment Clause. This means that under the Constitution, the United States is not allowed to declare itself as a Christian nation or any other religious nation. I said this before, but this is why the United States is under no threat from Sharia law. We're allowed to pull ideas from religion and make them into laws. You know, not all religious religious ideas are bad, like no murdering or no stealing, stuff like that. But in doing that, you're not allowed to say that this is a religious law, Christian, Islamic, or otherwise. This also means that the United States is not allowed to favor one religion over another. If you want to talk about original intent, this was originally meant to mean that you can't favor Anglicans over Episcopalians or Catholics over Jews, because individual states were allowed to have an official state religion. It was the federal government that wasn't allowed to declare a national religion or treat any of the religions differently. State religions have obviously been abolished, but I'll get to that in a moment. The Establishment Clause is usually referred to as freedom from religion, as in the government is not allowed to impose a religion upon you, or treat any of the religions favorably which would urge you to convert to that religion, or declare themselves as a Christian or any other religious nation. The federal government of the United States is a secular government. The second part of religious freedom is the Free Exercise Clause. Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This means they can't write any laws that stop you from being any religion you want. It does not mean that you are free to do anything that is part of your religion. For example, if part of your religion is to kill non-believers, or homosexuals, or cheating wives, you obviously cannot do that in the United States of America. But generally, as long as what you're doing does not cause harm to any person or animal and does not impose your religion upon others, you're pretty free to do as you please. The government saying that your local courthouse cannot have a monument to the Ten Commandments is not the government prohibiting the free exercise of religion. It's the government not respecting the establishment of a religion. You are allowed to have a nativity scene on your front lawn, unless it's so large, obstructive, or noisy that it breaks some other law. But your city 
Hall cannot because that would be the establishment of a religion. You're allowed to say Merry Christmas all you want. There's never been a rule against that. Unless you work for a company that wants you to be inclusive and say Happy Holidays instead. That's not the government infringing on your free exercise, and it's not the company infringing on your free speech. It's inclusive rather than exclusive. That, and as I said in my free speech video, private companies are allowed to fire you over what you say. Free speech only means that the government can't put you in jail for what you say, but that's beside the point. In the United States, thanks to the Free Exercise Clause, you're allowed to be any religion you want. You're allowed to practice that religion as long as you don't break any other laws. If you remember my video on the 14th Amendment, this amendment made the Bill of Rights apply to the states. Prior to the 14th Amendment, many states had their own versions of the Bill of Rights, but now we were all on the same page. This also effectively abolished state-endorsed religion. You could still practice whatever religion you choose, it just means that the state is not allowed to declare an official religion. Now a lot of that seemed to get a little muddy during the Red Scare following World War II. We had to be as polar opposite from the Soviets as we could possibly be. This. Not the founding of the nation, but this, the Red Scare, is what put us on the path to cause many Americans today to believe that we are a Christian nation. Again, we are not, but it's pretty easy to understand why someone today might think that. The Soviets were atheist and secular, and religion was actively oppressed. So the United States, being the opposite, endorsed religion, especially Christianity. Since 1782, the motto of the United States was e pluribus unum, meaning out of many, one signifying the unitedness of the United States. But in 1956, Congress and President Eisenhower officially changed the motto to In God We Trust. It started appearing on all of our paper money the very next year. In God We Trust actually comes from the Star Spangled Banner's fourth verse. I bet you didn't even know that the national anthem had four verses. The most unbelievable part of that movie is that someone is singing the fourth verse of the national anthem at a football game. But anyway, originally it was In God Is Our Trust, but was shortened to In God We Trust when it was first put on a coin in 1865. The second thing everyone who says that we are a Christian nation points to as evidence is the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance was first written in 1892 in the aftermath of the Civil War and read, I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In 1923, the words my flag were changed to the flag of the United States, mostly because America was experiencing an immigrant boom from Europe. So in order to stop any confusion of people thinking my flag meant the flag of the country of my birth, they changed it to be a little more clear. This version of the pledge was officially adopted by Congress in 1942. During the Red Scare in 1952, they decided to add the words under God to the pledge. Back in the 50s, people argued that this was a breach of the Establishment Clause, as many people today still argue. The counter-argument to this is that it just says God and doesn't specify any particular God, so it could be the Christian God or any other God but it is still, at least in part, endorsing a religion, as opposed to no religion, or a religion that has many gods or no god. But they've been part of our culture now for at least 60 years, so there are very few people remaining who remember a time when God was not on our money or not in our pledge. So nowadays, people believe that it's always been, because at least for them, it has always been. But on the topic of now, we have a new president who has done things and has promised to do things that many people say violate religious freedom. So we're gonna talk about two of them. Firstly, something he's done already, the Muslim ban. At least, that's the shorthand name for it. On January 27th, Trump signed an executive order that doesn't specifically ban Muslims, but it pretty much bans Muslims. Here is Rudy Giuliani. Does the ban have anything to do with religion? How did the president decide the seven countries? Uh, I understand the permanent ban on the refugees. Okay. Uh, um, and, okay, I'll talk to me. Tell you the whole history of it. So right. when he first announced it, he said Muslim ban. He called me up, he said, put a commission together, show me the right way to do it legally. But okay, that's Rudy Giuliani saying that it was a Muslim ban, not Trump. So here's Trump. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on. Let me say that again a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. In short, a Muslim ban. 
Now obviously his executive order did not use those specific words because that would be crazy illegal. So what did it actually do? Bans all immigrant and non-immigrant entry for citizens of seven countries for 90 days. Iraq, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen. These are all Muslim-majority countries. There's a notable absence of countries where known terrorists have come from, such as the 9-11 hijackers who came from Saudi Arabia. And no citizens of those seven countries that were specified have ever killed an American in the United States. Ever. No refugees will be allowed entry into the United States for 120 days from any country. Refugees from Syria are banned indefinitely. The vetting process for refugees already takes up to two years. This also bans Christians and refugees of any other faith, as well as the interpreters who helped the United States during the Iraq War. There are a few smaller details of the ban which John Green discusses in depth in this video which I highly recommend, but those are the two main bits. Before I move on to the religious freedom argument, let's get one more misconception out of the way. Um, I, I bet there was very little coverage. I bet, I bet it's brand new information to people that President Obama had a six-month ban on the Iraqi refugee program after two Iraqis came here to this country, mm. were radicalized, and there were the master, masterminds behind the Bowling Green Massacre. Well, I mean, most people don't know that because it didn't get covered. Okay, let's start with the fact that the Bowling Green Massacre isn't a thing. And I don't mean that refugees didn't do it or that it wasn't that bad so it shouldn't be called a massacre. I mean she just straight up made that up out of thin air. Also no, Obama did not instate a six month ban on Iraqi refugees. What she's referring to here is the six month period where Obama significantly slowed down the refugee process by requiring additional background checks. But refugees were permitted entry into our country every single month during that six month period. If you want to equate this to a time where a Democrat did do something similar, you totally can. FDR banned taking in Jewish refugees in the years leading up to World War II. Not exactly our proudest moment. So you can absolutely draw that parallel, you just can't do it with Obama. So anyway, Trump's Muslim ban is in the process of being overturned and flipped and dismantled for several reasons. One of which was that this is against the free exercise clause. Banning Muslims on the basis of their religion is prohibiting the free exercise of religion. Does the executive order flat out ban Muslims? No but it's pretty clear that was his intent. He also intends to favor Christian refugees when the refugee program is restarted. As it relates to persecuted Christians, do you, do you see them as kind of a priority here? As yes. A, as a per you do? Yes, they've been horribly treated. Do you know, if you were a Christian in Syria, it was impossible, very, very, t at least very, very tough to get into the United States. And I thought it was very, very unfair. So we are going to help them. Favoring one religion over any others is a clear breach of the Establishment Clause. Let's also make it clear that prior to Trump's order, the religion of a refugee was not taken into account. It was no more difficult for a Christian than it was for a Muslim. If you take in refugees, you cannot pick and choose people based on their religion. That not only breaks US law, but all sorts of international agreements like the Geneva Convention, and you just, you just can't. Okay, look, I don't want to just keep making Trump videos. I had a completely different topic in mind for this week, but after seeing some of the things unfold, I had to speak up. The separation of church and state was already on my list of ideas, so when I saw what was going on this week, I just decided to fold it into a more generalized topic. Sometimes if you have a platform, you can't just sit around and not say anything. I'll try to make a more concerted effort to not do Trump videos in the future because I just don't want to. It, actually, it's kind of depressing, to be honest. Anyway, let's move on to the second thing he did. During his campaign, and again this week, Trump vowed to repeal the Johnson Amendment. It's not a constitutional amendment like the Bill of Rights. It's just an amendment to a tax law. Trump, Pence, and many others have argued for repealing the amendment based on the fact that it infringes on religious liberty. But does it? The law prohibits any nonprofit 501c3 organizations from making any contributions to political campaigns or making statements of endorsement or opposition to any particular political candidate. That's it. If you do these things, you run the risk of losing your tax exempt status. This means that a church cannot openly endorse a political candidate. It's usually pretty obvious who your priest or pastor endorses, but that's different. A person is allowed to express their views, but a church in an official capacity cannot. Churches are allowed to publicly oppose abortion, gay marriage, and any other issue they want. They just can't endorse a political candidate. So is that religious freedom? 
If you follow me on my Facebook page, which you should totally do by the way, I wrote a few paragraphs about the repercussions of repealing this law. So spoiler alert to any of you who read that, repealing this law would open the door for far more than just allowing a church to endorse a political candidate without losing its tax exempt status. This would apply to all 501c3 organizations, including churches and charitable organizations. The Trump Foundation and the Clinton Foundation are both 501c3 organizations. So repealing this law would mean that they could also endorse political candidates. And thanks to Citizens United, money is also speech. I'll probably end up doing an entire video on that Supreme Court case, but in short, it allowed corporations and super PACs to directly fund political campaigns. Repealing this law would mean that all 501c3 organizations could donate unlimited funds to political campaigns. Donations to charitable organizations are also tax-free. Just imagine the huge Pandora's box this would be opening. It's basically a whole new stream of anonymous, unlimited, tax-free political contributions. Your local evangelical church could raise hundreds of thousands of dollars, or the Mormon Church or Scientology and give it to a political campaign and openly endorse that person. The Trump Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, Planned Parenthood, and all other nonprofits. The Johnson Amendment is not an infringement on free speech or religious liberty. Repealing it, though, is a campaign finance nightmare. Not only because now nonprofits would be able to endorse and fund political campaigns, but because the church could get involved in government. This would be a breach of separation of church and state. The government does not belong in the church, and the church does not belong in government. That is what the Constitution intends. So as we watch things unfold in the coming months and years, hopefully now, you know better. Hey guys, if you enjoyed that video or you learned something, make sure to give that like button a click. If you'd like to see more from me, I put out new videos every weekend-ish, so go ahead and respect the establishment of that subscribe button. Also make sure to follow me on Facebook and Twitter and join us on the Reddit. But in the meantime, if you'd like to watch one of my older videos, how about this one? <laughs>